Hello? Okay. Good evening and welcome to the study of the Word of God with Spring Valley Bible Church. I'm Phil McMillan and uh, uh, first thing we need to do is prepare for worship uh, with prayer. Nothing we can say or do is uh, worthwhile to God unless it's done in His power. So search your souls, lay aside your guilt, self-obsession, and problems, and ask Him for the eyes and ears of God the Holy Spirit so that we all we say and do may edify this body and glorify our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening uh, with thanks and uh, uh, for the opportunity to look at your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit would give us the eyes and ears to understand what you're uh, tell telling us in your word and that we might uh, recall them in the power of your spirit uh, as we go through our lives this week and apply them that we might be blessed and that we might be uh, glorifying to our Lord and Savior. For it's in his name that we pray, sir. Amen. Well, we have to uh, uh, start with a, a prayer. And uh, we have an urgent prayer request that you would have seen earlier tonight if you uh, are on our uh, email prayer list. I uh, got a text from Judith earlier today. And Herman uh, uh, has... has uh, been taken to the emergency room earlier today. She said that he was uh, in bed most of the day yesterday, which is really not like Herman, and that uh, uh, they, so she, uh, he was running a slight fever this morning, so she took them, took him to the emergency room, and uh, they've been monitoring him. His oxygen levels are very low. His, uh, uh, I reported, I think, last week that he is having trouble with, uh, uh, his heart rhythm, AFib, and uh, that that was low. And so he's just not getting the uh, oxygen circulation that he needs for his, his body to be strong. And uh, so they have kept him overnight at least so that uh, he would uh, could be monitored and that they might uh, continue to make sure that he's uh, uh, responding to his med medications and all. Uh, keep a, an eye on... Uh, uh, for emails, as soon as we get any update, we will certainly put that out um, just as we put out the emergency prayer request. And uh, prayers for Herman and Judith are number one on our prayer list as always this evening. And of course, our nation, uh, we need to continue to be in prayer for the work of, of uh, God the Holy Spirit and each and every believer that uh, the gospel may be known to all and that his spirit and the spirit of God can work in those who believe and perhaps save our nation if we are uh, to be used by him in the future. Uh, we need the dissemination of the gospel and the power of his spirit in more and more people in our nation. So with these two things in mind, uh, let us uh, bow our heads in prayer once again. Heavenly Father, we just lift up our, our beloved pastor, Herman. We just pray so much that uh, you would heal his, uh, um, um, hasten his recovery and heal his body, guide his doctors, Heavenly Father, that they might uh, determine exactly what's going on and, and get these things under control. Uh, Heavenly Father, he he's, uh, uh, needs these things stable that he can continue to heal. Um, we were encouraged earlier this week in his progress in therapy and uh, uh, hate to see a setback now in any manner. We just pray you would continue to heal and work in his body. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Judith. Uh, she was uh, uh, allowed to stay with him for a while. We pray that uh, she would have a maximum support and contact with Herman as he, as he carries on there at the hospital. Heavenly Father, we pray your spirit would be with Judith. Give her peace and comfort in, these, in this difficult time as she uh, stands helpless to uh, uh, do anything for Herman and, and just wait on the doctors and, and your power to work. Heavenly Father, give her peace. Give us uh, encouragement, Lord, that uh, uh, our church might uh, bind together at this moment and, uh, and through the evening that we might lift up our pastor and that you might hear our prayers and, and restore him to us. 
We pray, Heavenly Father, for our nation. We pray for the word of your spirit in our lives and pray that you would um, allow us the opportunity to spread your word and uh, uh, both here domestically and, and as far as the internet will carry us and continue to support those, those who take the word afield. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that the uh, work of your spirit in our uh, <coughs> local assembly would uh, aid in the work of your spirit in our nation and that we might be carried through for another day. Each and every day is your grace, Heavenly Father. Pray that we would use it to glorify your Son. In his name we pray, sir. Amen. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Excuse me, Gigi. Can I have some water, please, sir? Thank you. Um, oh, that's not the activating of the, of the mic? <laughs> No, that was a real cough. Oh, that was a real cough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I remind you that when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaim, proclaiming to you the mysteries of God. Thank you, sir. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him, him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. It's uh, uh, my awesome privilege to uh, continue studying with you this evening. Uh, looks like I'll be with you for a while until uh, uh, Kit or uh, Chris decides they uh, want to teach a class or two. And uh, uh, we are going to continue tonight in our study in Timothy. Uh, let's see, a few weeks ago we did a, 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 a background information on Timothy and just got a, uh, an overview of that, that relationship between the Apostle Paul and young Timothy, who as uh, um, um, uh, Paul met probably on the first missionary journey, but Timothy jo uh, 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 joined Paul in his mission to spread the gospel to all the corners of the earth uh, uh, in the second missionary journey. And uh, we've seen that he's pretty much been with Paul or on a mission from Paul to take the word somewhere and, and teach believers. And uh, now he has uh, been assigned to the church in Ephesus at this point in his life. And Paul is writing to Timothy from prison. And uh, we, uh, let's see. We began last time making just a general outline of the book of Timothy. And we're gonna pick up where we left off. Actually, I do wanna kinda give you a brief overview for those who might not have joined us last time. So that uh, uh, if you're, you're coming in cold on this class, you won't be completely lost. We uh, are just doing a quick read through an outline right now. I'm just gonna repeat the outline up to where we were at last time. So uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter one, uh, first two verses there, chapter one, one two, through two is the salutation. We see uh, right after that, Paul jumps right into what he's, he's talking to Timothy about, why he's writing this letter to Timothy. And a lot of what he's writing to him about is uh, uh, how to respond to false teachers that have crept up in the church at Ephesus since Paul had been there and, and taught them the true gospel. And so we see in uh, 1 Timothy 1, 3 through uh, uh, 7, the nature of heresies in general. And uh, uh, here we see Paul is, is talking about uh, Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic teachings that have come into their uh, uh, congregation. And we'll look closer at the nature of Gnostic teaching and, and uh, uh, find that it is... Uh, uh, a first generation heresy of the church, but it has uh, in a lar large extent never gone away, even though we've, we've fought it back again and again, okay? And uh, 
Let's see. So that uh, in uh, three through First uh, Timothy one three through seven is is uh, Paul's response to uh, Gnostics, and uh, uh, in eight through eleven we see a second attack that Timothy is having to deal with in his church, and that's with uh, 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 Judaizers who would come in and teach that uh, Christians had to keep the Mosaic law because Jesus was a Jew and and. Uh, uh, if they're going to uh, come into a Jewish belief, they have to do it through the law of Moses. And uh, so Paul gives uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 1, uh, 8 through 11, he gives the true purpose of the law. And uh, then in uh, 12 through 17, he, he talks about uh, the purpose of of, of uh, uh, or how God has been so gracious to Paul. And, and when he does this, he's not only talking about how graced he is to have received salvation and have the opportunity to teach the gospel of Christ, but also he's setting up the fact that he was a Pharisee. He was an expert in the law. And so he is, is more than qualified to uh, come back on uh, these who would say that the law must be kept to be a Christian. So uh, that's in 1 Timothy 12 through uh, uh, 17. 17. And then uh, uh, purpose of Paul's instructions to Timothy in uh, 1, 18 through 20. Um, uh, he tells him that he's uh, uh, telling him these things. Uh, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecy previously made concerning you, that by them, these things he's telling him, you may fight the good fight. He's trying to uh, uh, lift up Timothy and uh, encourage him to keep teaching the truth. Keep faith and good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. And uh, uh, then uh, we begin a section of, of uh, Timothy in chapters 2 and chapter 3, where Timothy is, is being told the rules by which to govern a, a local body. And this is one of the reasons that Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and the book of Titus are called the pastoral epistles. They are instructions to the first generation pastor teachers on how to organize and lead their local assembly. In uh, uh, First Timothy chapter two, uh, uh, we get instruction on prayer in public uh, worship and how that's to be conducted. Uh, and uh, in two nine through fifteen, he talks about the role of women in public worship. And uh, then in uh, picking up in chapter three verse one. Uh, we see the qualifications for church officers. Uh, we see overseers, bishops in chapters 3, 1 through 7, and deacons in chapter 3, 8 through 13. We'll be looking closer at, at what those titles mean, uh, overseer and deacon. And uh, then again, after he gives these instructions, he tells him why he's given these instructions in 3, 14 through 16. I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth, right? The church is God's representation on this earth. Just as Christ was called the flashing forth of God's essence, the church that Christ has left is supposed to be the representation of God through Christ on the earth. And, and that's why he's giving him this advice of, of, of how to conduct the church and the operations of the church. He wants the church to uh, be upright uh, blameless before man in their demonstration of, of love and their use of the, the things entrusted to them that they might spread the word of God. So the church of the living God, which is the pillar and support of the truth. And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. And remember that Christ is the mystery. 
that Christ would come and die for our sins was the, the, the thing that no one understood in the Old Testament. They didn't know that, that Christ was going to gonna come and pay the price for their sin. They were told that there would be a Messiah. They were told that they would be redeemed, but they weren't told in the way that they would be redeemed. And often, they, even though they were given hint after hint, from the time of Abraham on, that, uh, or even in the Garden of Eden, that blood had to be shed for redemption. Uh, uh, they, they, they missed the point that Jesus was going to die for their sins. And, and in the Old Testament, they had the gospel of the promise. They had to, to gain salvation. They believed that God was going to do the work to redeem them, that, as God had promised. But they did not. They didn't catch that it was the Messiah, that it was God who became man, that was going to do that work. So, uh, uh, by common confession, that means all of them believe this following statement: "Statement, great is the mystery of godliness, or Christ." And then he describes Christ: He who was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. A magnificent description of our Lord and Savior. Uh, we'll look at, it, at each of those closer, each of those lines closer when we get to that uh, line by line uh, study. So we're going to pick up now in chapter four, and this is about where we left off last time. Um, and uh, starting in chapter four, we're going to see uh, some more instructions to Timothy concerning the false teaching that he's having to face, okay? And uh, uh, he, uh, Paul begins by describing uh, false teaching in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Let's just read through this. Uh, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Uh, for everything is created, everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. One of the, first, one of the uh, three or four verses that, that uh, give us the basis of sanctifying our food before we eat it. We ask God that this, this uh, 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 nourishment be set apart as we are set apart, that it may uh, feed our, bo our bodies, not as part of this world, but as part of the body of Christ. And um, um, when you hear him talking uh, three men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, that's, that's a belief of, of Gnosticism, that uh, men shouldn't get married, that they should uh, remain single and, and uh, um, uh, that they would um, not eat meat. Vegetarianism was a big thing for Gnostics. And we'll look at some of the other things that that, that, that her heretical belief followed. Let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, and we'll see in verse 2, uh, hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. That's in direct contrast to what he told Timothy about having uh, uh, a clear conscience earlier, a good conscience in, in chapter uh, 119. And we'll look at that contrast too. So uh, uh, everything is uh, created by God is good. He's talking about the things to eat. The Institute of Barrage, the Institute of Nationalism, these are all created by God and they are good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude for it, and food, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. So in, uh, 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 so there's the, the basic description of some of the Gnostic principles that are being taught to believers in Ephesus in 1 through 5. Um, then in 4, 6 through 16, 
Paul is going to give Timothy some uh, ammunition to fight these heresies, okay? Other than just telling him that that isn't right, which is what he did as he as he presented those those heresies in one through five. He's gonna he's gonna uh, point these things out, and he's going to give Timothy some ammunition to fight back with here. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of, G of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of sound doctrine, which you have been following. Good doctrine that you have been following. Remember, we aren't given uh, uh, crazy lists of things to do and not do as Christians. We follow uh, uh, simple faith in, in our Savior and simple faith in a power of His Spirit in our lives. And we don't have to worry about the things we don't do. We have to worry about the things that we do, right? And we want to examine those in the power of the Spirit and know that uh, uh, we are demonstrating Christ's love through the fruits of His Spirit in our lives. There's uh, uh, nothing wrong with those things. If we're doing those, we aren't breaking anybody's rules. So uh, we don't have to worry about a long list of no's when we've got such a thorough list of do's. Uh, and pointing out these things, you will be a good servant, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself in the purpose of godliness. Again, we're seeing here uh, uh, in the purpose of godliness, the, the role that we're given, the, the, the command that we're given to love others as Christ's love, and we're given that through the word of God. We aren't uh, following some uh, fable, some uh, uh, ancient story of man um, um, that have uh, uh, nothing to do with the Bible. They're just uh, old, old fables and stories to teach you to, to uh, live according to a standard of works. And uh, uh, like uh, you could even say Aesop's fables, those kind of things that are morality tales to tell you how to live your life. And, and those are all good things that they're usually teaching. They're teaching patience. They're teaching uh, kindness to others. They're teaching uh, to not be greedy. Uh, uh, those are all honorable things when they're produced by God, the Holy Spirit. But if you try to produce those things on the basis of some other system of works, some system of works, then uh, you're not glorifying God. It's not for the purpose of godliness that you do those things. Uh, continuing on in verse 8, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So if you uh, uh, follow a, a good regimen of exercise, it's, it's, it's not worthless. It helps your body. It helps you feel better and all these kind of things. Uh, but only, only going to help this body on this earth is all it's going to do. When we follow God the Holy Spirit and we live in his power and produce the fruits of the Spirit, we are not only helped in this present life, we're also being, being profited in the life to come. Our eternal reward counts on how much time we remain in the Spirit, how much the Spirit does through us to glorify Christ here on earth. That's what our eternal reward is based on. And uh, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, some great church work. It can just simply be the interactions you have with your family members. It can be the way you treat others in school or at work. It can be in any way that you represent the love of Christ here in the devil's world. And that is good for eternal reward, keeping your faith and producing those fruits. It is a trustworthy, continuing on in verse 9, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, for, uh, for, it, is, for it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Now, that's a strange statement, you might think, that he's the Savior of all men, especially of believers, but Christ paid the, the penalty for all the sin ever committed uh, by every member of the human, human race, right? To redeem us, he, he paid the price of all sin. And that's a benefit 
that is available for everybody on the earth. Whosoever will believe in Jesus Christ will be saved, right? So everybody has already got the benefit of Christ dying for everyone's sin. They have to make a decision, a faith decision, to be benefited by that, by that work. So those who, uh, Christ is the Savior of all men, but especially the ones who believe in him, because we're going to receive the, the reward of eternal life for that simple act of faith. Prescribe and teach these things, okay? Prescribe and teach these things, that uh, we uh, labor and strive on the hope of, with the hope of the living God for his glory. So, um, uh, yeah, four, six, three, six, eight. Uh, prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on you for your youthfulness. This is a a, a, a refrigerator verse. I was gonna take you would say uh, it's something that we remind uh, the the young people in Liberty Youth Ministry all the time. I try to tell them each and every time I get a chance to teach those young people that they have every bit 100% the uh, power of God, the Holy Spirit available to them that I do. They have the opportunity to, to tell others about Christ. They let that, that power of God, the Holy Spirit, work in them so that they can uh, 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 glorify Christ in their lives. And it's just as much a benefit in this world if a 15-year-old a, a does it as is, is if a, a, an 80-year-old does it. Okay, so, uh, and Timothy, as we said, is several years younger than, than Paul. And um, um, uh, so if he's in a church with a lot of older people, it can be difficult for him as a very young person to uh, uh, exert any kind of authority over those, those, those people. They look at him as a young whippersnapper, right? So uh, let no one look down on your, on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Okay. Um, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to and teaching. Right? They're reading the Torah, the Old Testament. They don't have the New Testament yet. Uh, 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 they, um, let's see. I believe he writes the Book of Ephesians later, so they don't even have that epistle at this point. So uh, uh, that means that when they say study the Scripture, that means that they are looking at the Old Testament. And just as Paul had taught him, um, uh, he's reading parts of the Old Testament and then teaching him how that is pointing to the coming Messiah and what the work of that Messiah would be and, uh, 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 and exhorting them to believe in Christ uh, because that's what the, the plan of God has always been for man, to rely on, on, on God in faith for uh, God's work and deliverance. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through prophetic utterance and the laying on of hands by the presbytery. That's the elders of the church have, have, were there present at, at his ordination. And it's this line we'll see uh, um, if uh, 14, first to, um, and, and 414, if you uh, turn back uh, to 1 Timothy 18, it says, uh, uh, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, well, this is exactly what they're talking about. There wasn't a, a, a soothsayer that, that uh, jumped up and, and uh, looked into a crystal ball and prophesied that Timothy would be used of God or anything. Prophesy is simply uh, 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 knowing or trusting that Timothy is going to do things for God. That's why they ordained him and laid hands on him. And here in 14, we uh, uh, see him, that recount of him being ordained and, and commissioned to teach the word of God to these people. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through prophetic utterance and with the laying on of hands by the elders of the church, the presbytery. That's where they get Presbyterians from, from that word presbytery. 
so uh, they're very uh, 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 driven by the elders and the boards in that church. I once met a, pre a retired Presbyterian preacher, pastor who was very glad to be out of the yoke of, of, of the clergy in a Presbyterian church because he was not allowed to even teach the God the Word of God as he saw fit because everything had to go through his board of deacons, you know, his elders. So he lost, he lost the opportunity to respond to God the Holy Spirit in his own soul and his teaching because he was controlled by the governance of that church. So you know, that's a, a, a way that, that church administration has gone, gone, has gone wrong. And, and it has done that uh, throughout the church age that uh, we have, uh, uh, people look through ways to control, to, to usurp the uh, authority given to the pastor and to say that uh, uh, they're going to uh, control everything that he does. We'll, we'll be looking into that as we continue the, the other instructions here. So, take pains with these things. Uh, be absorbed in them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Again, that when we see that word salvation, we've always got to look to context. And here he's talking to Timothy and to his uh, uh, his church. So we've got a context of believers, right? Well, what is it that what salvation are they looking for? Where well, they aren't looking for the salvation of, of justification before God through the redemptive work of Christ. They're looking for the salvation of the sanctification of God, the Holy Spirit in their lives. And uh, uh, you will ensure the sanctif your sanctification, both for yourself and for those who hear you. If you continue paying close attention to the teaching and, uh, and uh, the results that that teaching has in your life. Remember, everything that we learn in the Word of God has got to have a different, make a difference in our lives. It's got to have a result. And that result that we're looking for is, is that we are blessed and God, the whole, and, and, and God is glorified. If those two things don't happen from what you perceive in the Word of God, then you have perceived something wrong in the word of God. It's got to benefit you and glorify the Lord. Okay? So, uh, uh, and, and the sanctification process is how we get more and more dependent on God, the Holy Spirit, which is more and more eternal rewards, as we've just noted previously, right? So even if in this world we have difficulties, we know that the work of the Spirit in our lives is good for blessing for all eternity, okay? So uh, that brings us through 416 and uh, uh, methods of dealing with the uh, false teachings coming at him. Now, what did we see in those methods of dealing? He didn't say Gnostics believe in this and it is wrong because of that. And they believe in, in, in uh, never marrying and that is wrong because uh, God has made uh, uh, help make corresponding for you. He didn't go through line by line. This is what the Gnostics believe and this is what, and this is what you should do. How did he combat the, te the false teaching in Ephesus? He told Timothy to stick to the word of God and to look to the work, work of God, the Holy Spirit, in his local assembly, okay? Uh, and uh, that's exactly what we do, uh, and, and the reason why we study the Word of God. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not big on apologetics. I, don't, I, don't, I, I do some, some work in apologetics from time to time, uh, but it's, it's very fruitless to me sometimes to argue with those who are hardened of heart. Uh, I, I do it because uh, the opportunity is in front of me and I must sometimes. But, uh, um, uh, and that's just God's grace extended to those people when I, I'm, I'm put in that position. I, I, it's the way I look at it and I'll do it. But I much prefer uh, speaking with believers who, who understand the importance of the word of God and uh, look, look to it to live, live and lead their lives. So, what is apologetics? 
apologetics is, is from the Greek word ap ap apologia, uh, which means defense, okay? And uh, uh, so it's not, I apologize, I'm sorry, for, I'm a Christian. It's not saying I'm sorry I'm a Christian. It's, it's, de it's uh, defending the principles of Christian faith, okay? Uh, have you ever heard of Ravi Zacharias, who just recently passed away? Tremendous, tremendous apologist. And uh, he just passed away, I think, last month or, or within the last six weeks. And uh, uh, he was uh, uh, a highly educated gentleman, and uh, uh, he did some tr tremendous work in, in, in going out and, and speak, debating with Muslims. He would debate anybody about why God's plan is, is what it is and why it is the truth. Uh, me, I just assume it's the truth and, and, and teach it from, from what it is here. That's expository, not apologetic. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. So uh, uh, to me, though, that, that's very interesting. You know, I told you uh, that, that we could tell from some of the phrases he makes, like uh, forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, well, we, we have extra biblical sources that tell us about these Gnostic teachers and some of the er, early church fathers, uh, Polycarp and, and those guys actually uh, wrote against Gnostic teaching. And, uh, uh, but the word of God doesn't teach about it, right? He's, he just says, uh, uh, makes a reference to them. So I've got to really go extra biblical information to give you background on Gnostic teaching and, and these kind of heresies. We assume that uh, 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 Timothy is combating here in Ephesus, but I'm not going to go far from the word of God because Paul didn't. It's uh, uh, not a matter of understanding what what their heresy is. It's a matter of let's understand the, the true gospel. Okay. In development in churches through the history, did they use some Gnosticism and some Christian practices? Absolutely, they, they did. They, in, in, in the development of early church, uh, she asked, did, do they use some of those principles? And yes, that's exactly what Timothy is having to deal with here. And, and that's even true today, right? People take uh, uh, the prosperity gospel and, and, and mix that in and, and water down the truth of the word of God. They, they take uh, tradition, uh, uh, Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox. They, they claim their superiority on tradition, right? And they say they know the real, real path of the church because uh, they're tied to those early church fathers and, and, and they've carried it on from, from the very apostles we're studying in the, in the Word of God. But they often negate the Word of God. They say, we, we have this tradition of, uh, uh, say, uh, sub transubstantiation. And uh, uh, it's the truth even though the Word of God doesn't teach it. Right. So, uh, uh, yes, these heresies still arise in, in the church as we know it today. And, and we're definitely, this is a first generation church in Ephesus where they're, they're combating these things. So you have the wisdom of man mixed into the gospel to, to water it down in, in Gnosticism. Gnostic means wisdom, you know, uh, uh, knowledge, right, in Greek. And uh, so these guys, they think they, they're so smart that they know more than, than God. And they're going to add to his word and his plan. And, and then you have the Judaizers who are just legalists, right? And there's many forms of legalism in the world and, and uh, always has been. Uh, different types of legalism, you know, and, and taking local customs and practices. That's why we have a lot of the weird things that we have in Christianity, like the date that Easter, our celebra celebration of the resurrection, it falls on the third, the, the, uh, the third Sunday or the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. And, and that is in, 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 actually in, in uh, 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 same time that uh, a Celtic uh, uh, goddess was, was, uh, had a celebration and was worshipped in England. And uh, so as to uh, uh, not take over, tell they, the Catholics that were evangelizing there didn't want to tell the people, you can't have your party because you believe in Jesus now. Instead, they said, okay, 
you're going to have the party on the same day that you always had it. Only uh, we're going to we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ instead of this goddess that you worshipped. Okay, and uh, uh, a lot of strange things. That, the fact that we uh, 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 celebrate the birth of Christ in December instead of when he was probably really born uh, uh, is is another thing that it's just tradition and and the uh, uh, compromise of of what history and the word of God actually teaches us to conform to the, the practices of man, right? But uh, that being said, you know, we aren't given rules of custom and practice in the, in, the, in the church age. We're given one ritual, do this in remembrance of me, right? The communion. And we're not told when we have to do it or, or what utensils we have to. Think about the Old, uh, the Old Testament. Every cup, every saucer, every spoon, every everything they used to worship God was laid out for them. They were told, take a take, you know, six ounces of pure silver and make a spoon and use that spoon to get the incense. You know, every little detail like that. We weren't given any such detail in our one ritual. We were simply told, do this in remembrance of of, of me, and uh, um, you know. Not so much on the custom and practices because we're allowed to do things as God the Holy Spirit sees fit in us. And so now we we uh, uh, celebrate the resurrection on, on some weird day. The important thing is that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And, uh, 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 and we have one day set aside uh, in church history, you know, traditionally that we do that. But resurrection of Christ is our hope for all eternity. The resurrection of Christ is, the, is God's seal of approval on his redeeming work. And if you're just waiting for one day of the year to celebrate that, you're missing the boat, okay? Easter, uh, uh, the celebration of the resurrection ought to be a part of your daily Christian uh, existence, not a once a year occurrence, okay? But I digress. Let's continue on with our uh, uh, outline here. We are... Uh, picking up in uh, 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 chapter five now, uh, instructions. Here we get instructions to uh, 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 different groups in the church, different groups of people. Um, uh, and this is going to go on all the way to uh, six two. Okay, uh, we start off uh, talking about older and 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 uh, younger people, and you know, this is a, a, a first century church. Uh, uh, in Ephesus, and and really, as you listen to the descriptions of some of the frictions going on, the, the, you know, the human soul hasn't changed since Adam. <laughs> we are we have the same old sin natures, and and we uh, uh, have the same natural conflicts between uh, 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 young people and older people, and and uh, uh, husbands and wives and dating issues and all of these things and who's in charge oh my goodness even the apostles i'm i'm greater in the kingdom of heaven than you right uh, uh all these things are are uh, uh, uh sources of of conflict and division in the church throughout the church age and so paul is and paul is is giving us some good clear advice on uh, how to deal with these kind of things that they're that they're going to happen and, and what he thinks, the way he thinks it should be, okay? Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father and to the younger men as brothers, right? How, how do you treat these groups of people that you have to deal with in love? Well, he tells, him, tells Timothy, right, the young, young Timothy who's being bullied by the, the presbytery there in Ephesus, don't sharply rebuke them. Don't call them down and, and, and try to uh, set them straight, you know, especially in public. You appeal to, appeal to them as a father, right? Relationship between you and him in love, right? That's the important thing, that we, that we deal with one another in, 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 in the relationship that we have through God the Holy Spirit. So you treat an older person as a father and a younger, and a younger man as a brother, the older women as mothers and the younger women as sisters in all purity. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Excuse 
to the uh, in all purity. And you got to put that in all purity in there because human beings, and anytime you have an, uh, uh, a situation of opposite sex in, interacting, there's there's the uh, 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 uprising of improprieties, right? So in all purity is a reminder that that there's going to be young ladies who get crushes on you or older ladies that get crushes on you. You're going to have opportunities to sin as, as uh, any kind, in any kind of leadership position in the church or in any relationship in the church. They got uh, a, a, a married man and a single woman and they, they get involved in, in some ministry and everything is wholesome and pure in it and the ministry starts going well and suddenly they start thinking, wow, we're in love and things happen, right? Well, God, the Holy Spirit didn't tell them they were in love. That was simply the, the transference of, of their human lust into the spiritual realm, right? And uh, uh, they they you, we have to... Uh, Keep those kind of things in mind as we work in the church, that when we are dealing with a, 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 the opposite sex, that we do it in all purity as, as uh, brothers and sisters, uh, not as boyfriends and girlfriends. Honor widows who are widows indeed. And we'll have to dig into that indeed part there, who are widows indeed. Well, he goes on to define it. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. <clears throat> some recompense to their parents. Um, yeah. So you have women who are, are have lost their husband and are by themselves, a widow indeed. And you have a woman who has lost her husband, but she has children that can help take care of her. They should be taking care of her uh, uh, it, to the, any extent that they can. And if they can't, then the church can step in and help out, right? Because uh, uh, they should... Make, uh, uh, make recompense to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. Right? That's, that's, that's her job. She's all alone in the world and uh, she hasn't got children and uh, she hasn't got a job in this case apparently. Uh, uh, Doing the work of the church in prayer, that's the thing she needs to be concentrating on, according to Paul. Uh, and why should she be doing the, those things? Continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. But six, but she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives, right? She's given herself over to the, the flesh. Any of us who are operating in, in the power of the flesh, though, though we may live and breathe, the in this world, we're dead because we're uh, uh, not part of the light. We're part of the dark. We're part of the dead. The, this uh, unredeemed, un uh, uh, unliving world. Um, prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. Okay? Keep commanding. Keep telling them these things. Remind them of these things so that they can be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever, right? Even unbelievers generally have the understand the principle that they should take care of their parents, take care of those in their family, and uh, if you uh, are your children, and if, if you are, are not doing this basic thing of love, trying to, take, trying to provide for and care for your own family, you aren't of any, any use in, in spreading the love of Christ. You aren't even taking care of the most basic human understanding of love, right? So uh, you're not doing the, the work of the church if you're not even taking care of your own household. He has, he has denied the faith, it says. Uh, let a widow be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man. Okay. So some qualifications there for, for putting, being made a ward of the church. 
having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitalities to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, and if she assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work, right? She's got to be a demonstrator of the love of God, okay? That's all he's saying here, is that she has demonstrated the love of God. You don't make a checklist out of this and say, okay, old lady, whose feet did you wash? Check. Okay, who did, who did you feed? Okay, you did that one. Well, wait, wait a second, wait a second. You haven't helped anybody in distress, right? So go, go do that one, and then, we'll, and then we'll see if we can give you some assistance, right? If we want to see the work of God, the Holy Spirit, in those that we take in and, and, and uh, uh, try to help out in our church, right? But refuse to put younger widows on the list, for when they feel sensual desires in disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous pledge, their, pre their faith. Okay, so you, you're not supposed to use the charity of the church to further your lustful uh, uh, human life in some way. You don't rely on the church for a while and then go back to uh, carousing around, okay? Uh, at the si same time, they also learn to be idle, right? They're young. They have the ability to, to work. There were jobs for women even in the ancient world. And if uh, uh, um, uh, they rely on the church, they aren't learning to take care of a family. They aren't learning to keep themselves busy. They're just being idle and uh, they're going to cause some trouble. So uh, as they go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, taking about things, not pro talking about things, not proper to mention. Uh, uh, therefore, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. Right? He he isn't. He is 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 putting down some. Uh, uh, recommendations on how to treat these people, not because he wants to control them, not because he wants to uh, 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 show his superiority over females or anything like that. He wants to keep them from the realm of Satan. Okay, And that's the bottom line on, on his instruction here. He wants to do what uh, 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 it's going to take for these young ladies who've been who've been widowed or uh, uh, to uh, uh, find a new husband, to to have a worthwhile life, and to glorify God, not uh, 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 become gossips and uh, uh, carouse around and get in trouble and uh, so follow Satan, right? You got to realize when it says follow Satan, it isn't saying become a member of a coven, right? It, it, uh, it isn't that blatant usually. It's it's simply following the, the ways of the flesh in, in the devil's world. By that, you follow Satan. If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, uh, let her assist them. And let not the church be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. Right? The church is going to help those who are helpless. Widows, indeed, is, is emphasizing the fact that they are helpless. They can't take care of themselves. They're older. They have no children to support them. They have no income, etc. Right, And uh, uh, those are the ones we want to help. If you have a, 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 a system of, of, of people around you, a family around you, that can, can lift you up and help you get reestablished in life, they're the ones who should do it. And not be, so that, so that the church doesn't have to take care of you. You have to. You should first take care of yourself. The number one thing in displaying the love of Christ is take care of yourself. Don't make other people take care of you if you can. Right? If you can't take care of yourself, the church, you're, those who love you, and then the church in turn, they're, we're going to be here for you. We're going to help you, as I've said uh, several times to. Our, our extended body out there in cyber world, 
if you're at home and you live in the Dallas area and you're in need, all you've got to do is reach out. We're going to do something to help you. Don't suffer in silence or go hungry. Uh, I sent Gigi over there with a pot of lasagna to knock your socks off, okay? Uh, all you got to do is, is uh, give us a call because uh, we, we care for our own. We're going to continue to care for our own to the best of our ability. Uh, so uh, the scripture... Um, Uh, let her assist them, let the, not the church be burdened, so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of d double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, so often I, I see some, some verses that... Uh, uh, pastors will use and say, uh, uh, "See, you you got to you got to pay your pastor." Uh, but this is one of the few I think that is actually saying, "Pay your pastor." Okay, he, uh, 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 the oxen you don't muzzle an oxen. He's turning a a, a, a heavy stone to grind wheat, and the wheat is going to fall to the ground. So as the oxen goes in a circle, he's going to stop and get a mouthful of food and and keep on walking, right? And 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 the they're saying he deserves those crumbs that fall to the ground as, as he's doing the the work that's going to feed you, right? You're going to eat the bread. He just wants a few grains of of, of wheat that have fallen down. So uh, the laborer is worthy of his wages. A worker is worthy of his wages is a phrase that we're going to, to take a little time to examine because it's, it's true uh, uh, in this sense that when we work for God, we get blessed by those things okay, that we do for God. But a worker is worthy of his wages is also a condemning phrase. Because when you work for your salvation, you're going to get exactly what you've got coming for you, for, to you, right? You, you, you work for three cents a day, you get that three cents, you don't get anything else, right? So when you work for your salvation, you're going to get all the reward that comes from that work. And that's eternal condemnation. That's what you deserve because it's your work you're setting before God. So we'll take some time to, to look at that, that phrase for sure. Um, let's see, a, work, a, work, a laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. This is uh, 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 part of the uh, Mosaic law. We hear it in James. We hear it in other parts of, of the New Testament that uh, uh, you don't uh, accept uh, uh, an accusation um, uh, uh, unless you have more than one person. Uh, I say he did it, and, and that's one witness. That isn't good enough to, to bring an indictment against anyone. For uh, those who continue in sin, rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest may also be fearful of sinning, right? I, and notice the condition there. They continue in sin, right? And this is that division between iniquity and sin. Iniqui sin is just transgression against the law. Iniquity is when you sin and call it right, okay? And uh, say that you're not going to do it. You're still in the plan of God. Iniquity is, is, is the thing, the basis of uh, kicking someone out of a church. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in the spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone too hastily and thus share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent ailments. Timothy apparently had a bad stomach. Uh, maybe a budding ulcer or something. The, uh, the sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment. But for others, their sins follow after, right? Sometimes you see the sins that people are doing and you want to condemn them. Sometimes you think they're doing great. And it's not until after they've gone that you realize the turmoil that they've caused, okay? Likewise, deeds that are good are quite evident. And those who are otherwise cannot be, those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. 
They may, you may not discover those sins until later, but a sin will always be found out, as my mother reminded me often. Okay? I uh, never could hide anything from that woman. Well, we got almost all the way through our outline. Sorry, there's one chapter left. I'll give it to you briefly, as we, and then we'll begin our uh, uh, line by line in the study of First Timothy next Wednesday night. I urge you guys to join us uh, live if you're so inclined Sunday morning at 9:30, and uh, we'll take a short break and have another class at 10:45. Right? Okay. She's got the schedule. She knows what's going on. Uh, so. Uh, Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope that you will be encouraged in the study of, of the Word and uh, prepared in your yourself for a closer examination of what's going on in this advice between Paul and Timothy as we drill down on it over the coming weeks. See you for the first class in Philippians next Sunday morning. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Thank you. Heavenly Father, for the chance to look to your word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for such clear direction, clear direction in our lives, that we might see the work of your Spirit in our lives and know that we're glorifying Christ through that work. Heavenly Father, such a simple plan for such uh, uh, silly children you have. We pray that our, our childlike faith may simply turn to thee. For those who have not believed in your Son, we pray that they would, would turn to him now. For those who have believed already, we pray that your spirit would guide them, comfort them in their lives, and help them in, through their journey, that they might glorify our Lord and Savior. For it's in his name that we pray, sir. Amen.